All right, well then let's begin. So I'd like to first thank the organizers and especially Anna for inviting me. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, low degree permutation statistics. Um, this is a bit of a departure from my main line of work, which is mostly about, um, I guess, combinatorics of Schubert calculus. This is quite different. Um, it is still algebraic combinatorics, but we're sort of trying to apply it to uh, probability of permutation statistics. So I want to start with three motivating examples. Um, so uh, perhaps you're familiar with the descent statistic for permutations. So uh, if you let pi be a permutation, um, we're defining des, and I'm doing this as a number, not a set. So it's just the number of uh, values i where pi of i is greater than pi of i plus one, i.e. the number of adjacent things that are uh, out of order, right? So in this example of pi, we have two descents, five to one, six to two, um, where I'm writing pi in one line notation. And then I'm also going to define m sub i of pi to be the number of i cycles. Um, so in this example, right, y is m1 uh, equal to 1 because 4 is a fixed point and it is the only fixed point. Likewise, um, 5 or 3 and 1 are a 2 cycle, and then 5, 6, and 2 form a 3 cycle. So these are all 1. And now I'm going to uh, state a result about the descent statistic, which is it sort of appropriately normalized converges to a normal distribution. Uh, so this convergence here is in distribution, if that's familiar. Um, and so what we're doing, we're taking the descent statistic applied to some random permutation. We're subtracting some quantity, which is essentially the mean, and then we're dividing by another quantity, essentially the variance. And so this is sort of the standard, um, I guess, convergence setup. And then it, the claim is that it converges to the normal distribution. Um, so this is for X, a uniform di uh, uniformly distributed permutation. This, I would say, is a, a classic result. I don't know if you could track down the original reference. Um, and so for the equation I've written here, you would set alpha equal to zero. Um, so then the second motivating result is sort of an upgrade. Um, so this is a result due to Jason Fullman in 98. So you let Xn still be a random permutation, but now you're saying that the limit of Mi of Xn equals zero for all i. Um, so what that means is that Say you're looking at you know five cycles, i equals five. Eventually, there's no five cycles. Right? That's what it's saying. So um, and then since we're saying that this is true not just for one i for but for all i, we would call this no or sorry, maybe not no, but all long cycles. So does this make sense to folks as sort of a constraint on what sort of permutations we might be talking about? Right, so like the canonical example would just be an end cycle. Obviously, it doesn't have any short cycles. And so eventually, once n is big enough, the number of i cycles will vanish. Um, and then again, we're setting alpha equals zero. Um, okay, now the third result is uh, more recent. The second result is due to Fullman in 98. Um, I think it was actually his uh, undergraduate thesis. Um, this result is due to Jean Kim and Sang Shul Lee. Uh, so Jean was a student of Fullman. Um, I, I guess Song Chul Lee was a student of Merrick Biscup at UCLA. Um, and they proved this well, was published in 2020. So now what we're saying is we're going to take a sequence of cycle types. Right? So mu n is a sequence of cycle types. And then this 
set k mu n here is the permutations with cycle type mu of n. So we're saying we look at all the permutations whose cycle type is this, and we're going to pick one at random. And then we're letting alpha be the limit as n goes to infinity of the number of fixed points over n, right? So uh, for alpha to be non-zero, you're saying you have like a huge amount of fixed points, linear in n, right? A normal permutation has in expectation one. So this we're, we're, we're dealing with a case where there's a lot of fixed points. And what they proved is even in this very general setting, you still get asymptotic normality. Um, and the mean and the variance are just functions of the sort of proportion of fixed points. Um, so this is uh, a type of result. And then the goal of this talk is to sort of outline a way where you can interpret all three of these, right, which are progressively more general as um, sort of special cases of general phenomena, right? Um, so before I move on, does anyone have any questions, A, about the examples or B, about like motivation, why we might want to sort of generalize this type of phenomenon? Okay, so I'm going to move on now, and I'm going to talk first about partial permutations. Um, and so towards that end, I need to define some, some functions. So this 1ij of pi, this is an indicator function. It's telling us that pi of i equals j. And then if I take sort of two ordered lists, I can just take the product of these terms. Um, and so this one capital I, capital J is just a whole bunch of these little one IJs. Um, and then the pairs that can occur, right? Because I'm not allowed any repetitions. If I have repetitions, it won't be, um, I guess, uh, it, permutations or bijections, right? So if I have repetitions in I or in J, I will not be taught describing uh, bijections, um, this SNK denotes all the pairs IJ that could work like this. Um, so we think of them as partial permutations uh, because you're saying I take a permutation, I restrict it to this set I, and then my output should be the J's in this order. Um, and it's not too tricky to expand a lot of permutation, functions of permutations in terms of these 1ij's. So if we think about des, what do we need? Well, we want to talk about two things that are next to each other, right? Because we're talking about adjacent terms in our permutation. So they could be in some position. And then we want them to be out of order. So we want some value i. And we have the term i i plus one, and then some values j less than k, which are the terms that occur out of order. So if we think back to our example of pi from before, where we're supposed to have two descents, right? This is sort of witness our descents at uh, the uh, one, two, three, because they're in positions two and three. And then what are the values? Well, it's five, one, right? Two maps to five, three maps to one. And then what's the other uh, tuple that gets us there? Someone want to toss that in chat? Uh, so five, six, right? Because it's in positions five and six. And then the values are Six two. Um, so 
I hope this definition is clear because all of our work is sort of built around working with these types of partial permutations. Um, okay, and this gives you at least a heuristic explanation for why the descent statistic itself should be asymptotically normal, right? Because we've expressed it as a sum of a whole bunch of things and they're not all independent, but they're sort of mostly independent. And the central limit theorem, right, says that sort of any reasonable averaging process should converge to the normal. And so as long as, so what does reasonable mean? It means independent, control over the mean or variance. This isn't quite independent, but there's a lot of tools that let you deal with this type of, um, I guess, weak dependence. Uh, the sort of weak dependence that shows up here. Um, but heuristically, right, we've described the descent statistic as a sum of a whole bunch of random variables that are mostly independent. And so it should morally be normal in the limit. Um, and I do want to remark that it's actually going to be easy to upgrade this from the uniform distribution to the end cycle. Um, I'm not going to go into why, but that, that's easy. All right. So, so far, we've sort of established some motivation. We've established some notation. And now I want to, this slide is sort of the, the core of the talk. This is the, the framework that we are attempting to apply. Um, and it draws from representation theory. Uh, so, the idea is you take a function of the symmetric group, and then you view it as an element of the group algebra. Um, so what does that mean? We're saying that this is just the span of pi in SN. So we're treating pi as like a formal object, and then we're building a vector space where these are the bases, basis elements. And then the coefficient, well, that can just be f of pi. And so this group algebra is a, um, I mean, it's just a, a different way of describing functions. Uh, the benefit of this is that it is an SN module. It is, um, Right, so it's it's an algebra, it's a vector space that also has products. Um, and it decomposes into a sort of direct sum of uh, smaller submodules. And in doing so, those those submodules are are indexed really by the cycle types, which are integer partitions, right? but it is also a conjugacy class, right? So we're saying that for each conjugacy class, there's some collection, uh, some subspace. And in fact, this, this algebra decomposes as a direct sum. Um, so for those who haven't seen this before, um, I hope that this is maybe some, some motivation to to appreciate the story of representation theory, um, because what we're going to learn is that this decomposition sort of encodes some very natural information about permutations. And maybe the place to start is at this degree less than or equal to k. Um, so I'm going to define a notion of degree, and I'm going to define it in two ways. So the first is when you decompose the group algebra this way, Uh, then you can say, okay, I'm going to look at the functions in this decomposition where I get zero everywhere except on certain of my parts, right? So I'm still talking about cycle type or integer partitions. 
and I've got my spaces that are indexed them by them. But now I'm only looking at the ones where my first part is like huge. It's n minus k. And as n grows, that really constrains how many partitions I'm dealing with, right? So this space here, there's sort of, uh, I guess, polynomial in k many terms. Whereas over here, you know, it, it grows super exponentially, I think. Um, so I'm looking at a very small slice of the group algebra, a very small set of functions. And then there's a purely combinatorial characterization, which is that they're literal, they're just linear combinations of these one IJs that I described on the previous slide. Um, so the observation that the one IJs uh, live here, right? That's due to diaconis, and then the fact that this is an if and only if characterization. Uh, the earliest reference I'm aware of is this Ellis Fried Pill Pell paper from 2012. Um, so the idea is we have two different descriptions of low degree. One is sort of algebraic, one is combinatorial, and the goal is essentially going to be to unify those. Um, all right, so on the other side, we have class functions. And if you're familiar with the representation theory of the symmetric group from a sort of algebraic perspective, um, this is a very natural place to look. Um, so what is a class function? It's a function that's invariant under conjugation or equivalently, it only depends on cycle type. Um, and so you might not necessarily think that these are the most important functions, but in the context of representation theory, they are because, uh, they sort of, uh, essentially determine the algebraic structures of these de decompositions. Um, so there's a way to project an arbitrary function into the space of class functions, uh, Basically, you just take all the possible conjugates and then take the average of that. Um, but there's this algebraic interpretation in terms of these irreducible characters. Um, and this is a sort of more uh, classical uh, part of the representation theory story. Um, and maybe I should emphasize one point here. Uh, this is a basis for the space of class functions. This is a spanning set. Right? So there are way more 1ij's than the dimension of this space. Um, whereas over here, we have an honest to goodness basis. All right. So now in this bottom right corner, I'm going to just say, okay, I'm going to be degree less than or equal to k. I'm also going to be a class function. And what we learn is that there's sort of two, pre two ways to view such functions. One is in the spanning, right? It's just the span of the characters that didn't vanish, the span of the characters that show up in the right spaces up here. Uh, and then the other perspective is that I have this projection onto class functions. I just apply it to the one ijs. Um, and in some sense, this first one, you could sort of think as a more algebraic description. The second one, again, is, is more combinatorial. Um, okay, so this is really the, the core of our outlook on this problem is we're going to take a function. It's pretty easy actually to tell when it's low degree because what is a one ij? It's it's easy to describe. And it, for a lot of permutation statistics, you can just write down a description like this. Um, when you do this Reynolds operator, it's sort of an averaging thing. And so it sort of looks like, you know, an expected value. It's still just an average of some combinatorial statistic. So this is still kind of this nice combinatorial description, but then we have this algebraic tool. Um, 
and so in a nutshell, our goal is really to, to relate these two descriptions of this space and extract information about permutation statistics as a consequence. All right, so the key classical tool that lets us do this is this theory of character polynomials. All right, um, so I'm realizing I never really defined an integer partition. I'm, I'm assuming that that's a, a happy thing for the folks in the audience. Um, but right, what is an integer partition? It's, you know, a weekly decreasing sequence of integers. Um, and then when I write this, what I'm saying is that those integers add up to K. Um, so I'm going to define a new partition of size N from one of size K by just sticking on a huge first part. So I guess I'm sort of assuming that N is much, much bigger than K when I make this definition. So I have a first part that's very long, and then I sort of stick the other parts on the end of that. Um, and so there's this classical theory of character polynomials. I, I don't quite know the history. I think it dates back maybe to the 1940s or even earlier. Um, so we have this character coming from the class function story. And it turns out that this is a polynomial in the cycle counts. So what I mean by that, right, is that if I apply chi lambda to pi, this is some polynomial in m1 of pi, the number of one cycles, m2 of pi, dot, 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 up to mk of pi. So maybe I will. write that a little more clearly. Okay, and so what we, we knew that class functions only depended on the cycle counts because those are the conjugacy classes and they're invariant under conjugation. Um, but what's striking about this is that they only defend, depend on sort of the short cycle counts, M1 through MK. Um, and that's pretty non-trivial. Um, and then there's sort of a, an upgrade. We know the degree of this polynomial, it's K. And this is actually the degree with respect to an unusual grading. So we're not taking the normal, like the naive grading we might guess, but we're saying that the degree of MI is actually I. Um, and this will prove to be a really valuable tool later on in the talk. Um, but this is actually enough to explain our second observation. Um, and not only to explain it, but to generalize it um, quite broadly, right? So we take a permutation statistic. And what I mean by that is just a function that makes sense, not just for one SN, but for all SN at once. And let's pretend that it converged to the normal distribution, right? So we take our statistic, we subtract the, the expected value, we divide by the variance. Um, and let's pretend that that's sort of asymptotically normal. Um, and then I guess I didn't add one of the assumptions we need, that it also needs to be sort of bounded degree. Um, so some degree K. So if we let Xn be random permutations with this all long cycles property that we discussed on the first slide, um, that's enough to sort of lift normality to this very non-uniform distribution, right? So we started with a statement about the uniform distribution on permutations, and now we're saying it actually works for all long cycles. Um, and so if we think about it, descent statistic clearly satisfies this assumption. And so suddenly, instead of saying this about descent statistic, we're saying it about like a, a wide variety of permutation statistics. There's a very large literature that includes many statistics that satisfy these types of properties. So like the peak um, statistic, the 
a whole bunch of counting statistics, like how many times does a pattern occur? They all fall under this framework. And, um, and yeah, they just this Fullman result lifts almost instantly to this setting just from this observation that we only care about the short cycle counts when we compute this chi lambda. Um, and why is that? Why is this true? Well, this expected value um, right? That's a class function. It doesn't depend on the cycle type of Xn, right? This is just a, I mean, it, it's, it's a very dumb function. It's, it's constant. Uh, well, so this is a class function. This is also a class function. And so um, more generally, all moments will be bounded degree class functions. And so I guess maybe I'm missing a word here of eventually. Ah, there we go. Okay. So what are we... So this result just sort of follows by observing the moments of our statistic with respect to this Xn, this new distribution, they're just gonna be literally the same as it was in the, the general setting uh, or the uniform setting. And so the result just lifts via the matching of moments. Okay, so this is sort of the, the warm up. The, the bigger motivation is to understand not just these all long cycles, but really any cycle type. Um, and to do that, we're going to have to um, develop some new techniques. Uh, so what I wanna do is I wanna sketch the outline of what our strategy is. Okay, so you recall F is a degree less than or equal to K class function. So what does that mean? It means that F is in the span of these chi lambdas. And if we knew how to write it that way, um, this character polynomial theorem gives us a lot of structure about what F looks like. Um, but more generally, it tends to be easier to write it as a linear combination of these partial permutations. And what's missing then is we don't actually know yet how to compute this Rn1ij and expand it into the basis of characters. And so the outline is you write your statistic as a pattern counting statistic. It counts certain partial permutations with weighted coefficients. We apply this Reynolds operator. Now we're talking about Rn of stat. Um, <clears throat> And I guess maybe I, I should expand a little on why this is good. What is Rn stat of pi? This is the average of stat on the conjugacy class of pi. And that is an expected value. On some conjugacy class, right? So when I apply this operation, I'm learning about the expected value of my statistic on an arbitrary conjugacy class. And that's why this would help us understand this Kim Lee result more generally of looking at a uniform permutation on a conjugacy class and trying to understand its behavior. Um, okay, so back to our outline. We have our N of stat. 
We write it now as the sum of our n1 ij's. And then the idea is we're going to group these terms so that they're all the same. So the idea is we want some sort of indexing object that determines this rn1ij function, um, but is more general. And then we sort of think of it as like the, the shape of a partial permutation. And so now we can sort of shrink how many, right? So now we only have to compute a few of these Rn1. Now I'm calling it new muse. Um, but the point is, right, I only have to compute a few of these rather than each of them individually. And then I have some coefficient. Uh, which I'm calling f lambda mu, uh, that is just this, this summation, this count of coefficients. So, and then I can expand Rn, these Rns into some sort of further coefficients. And then if I know how to control f lambda mu, I know how to control this C, then I know how to control my coefficients. And so generally our results are sort of structural. They're saying this is a polynomial with certain degree properties, that's a polynomial with certain degree properties, or maybe a rational function. And then this we know from the character theory of polynomials is also a polynomial. And so what we've learned is that our expected value is a polynomial with certain properties or a rational function with certain properties. Um, and since, uh, and then we can do the same thing for powers of stat. That's just another function that looks like this. So we're really learning structural properties of moments of permutation statistics. So this is sort of the outline. And then what I'd like to do is talk a little about how we apply this outline. Okay. So first I wanna talk about uh, these new objects, which we call, I think actually not vincular, but uh, constrained translates. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with a partial permutation, and then I'm going to call it packed if I union J is an initial interval. So here's an example, I is 2, 3, J is 3, 1. Right, that would be packed because I have two, three, I have three, one, so I have one, two, three. Um, all right, and then for a set of size M, I'm going to define S of I and S of J. Really, I'm going to do it by example. So let's let S be this six, nine, 10. So S of I is just, right, this is sort of secretly one, two, and three. So where before I had a two, three, now I have a nine, 10. Whereas before I had a three, one, now I have a 10, six. And then I define Tij as this sum over S, any M element subset of one through N. And then I have one Si, Sj. So Right, these are the M element subsets. Of one, two, dot, 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 M. Um, and then I we actually operate with some upgrades. So I haven't really talked about constraints at all. Um, what I mean by a constraint is I'm going to stick some set A here. And this is going to be contained in... one through M minus one. And then I reference A here, and what am I insisting? I'm insisting on adjacency conditions. So I think this might be best understood via the example of expanding our descent set. Um, right, so what are the possibilities? One possibility is that 
I have I, maybe, let's, actually, let's do this, this one. Okay, so what do I mean here? I'm looking at the sum of I, J, J plus one, J plus one, J, J, I. Okay, so what is this two telling me? This two is telling me that two and three are adjacent. And then this one, two, and three values are telling me the relative order of the terms appearing in my descent. And so I'm looking at sort of a nice subset of the terms that occurred in our descent expansion earlier. And if you check, there's sort of these eight terms are the ones that could occur. So we have this sort of new collection of permutation statistics uh, that we can use to write them. And the benefit of this is that in terms of sort of the partial permutations, they all sort of look the same when you sort of forget about the labels, right? They have the same sort of relationships between the I part and the J part. Um, and this is what we needed for our grouping term before. Okay, so now what I'm going to go to next is I'm going to talk about this expand. We want to somehow understand these Rn1 new mu's. Um, and the uh, idea would be, okay, I mean, all right, so we, I'm going to sort of black box this theorem. So this is maybe the hardest part of our paper, is understanding Rn1ij in terms of the characters. Um, and the final payoff of our, of our work is that you get a rational function. So you have this 1 over... Uh, n falling factorial k, so this would be, you know, n, n minus one, dot, 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 n minus k plus one, I think. Um, and then your coefficient of chi lambda, your character, is going to be a polynomial in n of degree at most l where L is sort of the size of your partial permutation. Um, and so this gives us sort of all the tools in this outline I gave earlier. And what I want to do in the last, I guess, 20 minutes or so of the talk is, is start applying some of these corollaries. Um, so maybe before I move on, there's this sort of payoff, right? Um, we can apply these Rn operators individually to each of the Ts. And when you apply Rn to a T, what that winds up being is you get some sort of counting function of how many terms occur in this summation. And then you get Rn of just one ij, where this is your packed partial perm. And so um, the idea is that these sort of, I, I, okay, I think I'm, I'm omitting a normalizing constant of one over n factorial. That's where this part kicks in. Um, but 
if you sort of apply our recipe, you get this, you apply R into the descent statistic, you get an explicit expansion. So this was computed previously uh, for descent and like a few other permutation statistics. Um, I don't think any of degree greater than three uh, or by uh, Holtman. Um, but the net effect is that um, you can first compute this expansion and then via the theory of character polynomials, break this down even further into an explicit polynomial in N, the M1s, the M2s, and I guess I keep saying polynomial and I mean rational function, right? Because we have over N in our expressions. Um, okay, so before we get to the applications, I think it would be worth taking a moment. Would it be helpful for anyone to go back over any steps of the outline? Like what the strategy is? Uh, yes, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, so is there a specific piece, Sheila, that you were interested uh, in? Maybe if, if you can scroll back, mm -hmm. let's see. Um, yeah, just this grouping, uh, what's the, I'm just, I just got lost in the new here. Okay, so yeah, so the idea is, <clears throat> right, I, I guess maybe the, the, the key idea here is that some of these are the same. Right, so. <laughs> You can have ij, and then you can have i prime j prime. And when you apply this Rn operator, this Reynolds operator, to one ij or one i prime j prime, you're going to get the same output. Um, in some sense, the, there's almost like a a cycle structure for partial permutations. Um, and that's what these two, and so if they have the same sort of cycle-like st structure, then they're going to be the same under conjugation, right? It's a conjug conjugation invariant, and that means that Rn does not detect it, so they, they should be the same. So then in the grouping step, what we're saying is, okay, we want some nice way to group the terms over here like to group all the terms in this expansion so that when we apply the Reynolds operator, we're gonna get the same output. I see. And that's what this constrained translate story is about is we're saying this is a good way to group these uh, terms. Right. Um, Right, so maybe I can, in this one example over here, right, so we're saying we have two maps to two, three maps to one. And so if two maps to two, what does that really mean that we're dealing with a fixed point? Mm -hmm. Right, and that structure is sort of preserved under conjugation. Um, by which I mean, if I conjugate something, I might change the label of three and one here, but I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to lose this information that there's a path that looks like this. Right. Okay. And so all of the terms in this expansion are going to sort of look like one of these. And so when I apply this, this Reynolds operator for this decomposition, each of these individual eight terms will look like, I was, I guess, trying to say it, I think up here, some number of terms, which is literally just how many mm. uh, copies of a partial permutation do I have in there? 
and then they all behave the same. So I just have to do it to one of them. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Thanks for slowing me down there. Um, okay. And so now we're sort of at the payoff slide and uh, I wasn't quite sure exactly what I wanted to say. So I, I left it at least partly blank. Um, all right, so we're going to call a statistic regular if it's in this span of constrained translates. And then if I take a regular function and I apply this Reynolds operator, and I'm actually going to multiply out by a normalizing term, which is this falling factorial where Q is the size of the largest constraint. So this is going to be a polynomial in N. And we're going to have like a lot of control over its degree. Um, it's going to be, I believe, less than or equal to uh, the size of or maybe k minus the size of lambda. Um, and then this is a character polynomial. So this looks like a polynomial in the M's. And so what we've learned is that this whole term is like this very nice rational function. Um, and we have a just, I mean, we can state, I guess, a very nice upper bounds on degrees. And so, um, as a corollary of this, what we can show is that if I take a sequence of cycle types of integer partitions, And I do have to have some sort of niceness condition, which I don't want to get into precisely, but it's sort of a, a non-degeneracy condition. Um, and then we're gonna let Xn be uniform on K mu N. So this is a uniformly random permutation whose cycle type is mu N. Then the expected value of stat of Xn and then we're going to divide by N to some appropriate power. This is just going to be a polynomial in the variable alpha, where alpha is this same limit that we saw at the very start. Um, and so if we think way, way, way back to our, our very first slide, what we're saying is that this expectation being a polynomial in alpha, um, that's a general phenomenon. And we can characterize a wide variety of permutation statistics where this expectation is going to look like that. Um, um, 
Okay. Now I'm going to define beta in roughly the same way. So this is the limiting proportion of two cycles. And then what we can prove is that the variance, I think we want to the 2p minus 1 here for whatever that appropriate power p is. This is going to be a polynomial in alpha and beta. And I guess I should say that the degrees here, I believe, are going to be p and 2p. So if we go back up to the uh, Kim Lee result, this variance term, and I think maybe I, I wanted a um, square root n in that denominator as well. Um, I omitted that. Um, this is also a polynomial in these alphas and betas, appropriately normalized. And that also is a general phenomenon. Um, now, it's a bit of a surprise in this example that beta doesn't show up. Um, that's something that Gene uh, Kim had proved previously um, that it wouldn't, or you wouldn't expect it to, maybe is a better way to say it. Um, but we can sort of say that more generally, the variance really does only depend on these two things. And there are permutation statistics where the variance does matter. I guess one example would be the exceedance statistic, the number of terms where I maps to something bigger than I. That will, in, in that, the variance um, does depend on the number of two, the proportion of two cycles. So, back down to this payoff, right? We see we have control over the mean, we have control over the variance. Um, what we don't know how to do is actually prove that the distribution lifts. We don't know how to do higher moments. We don't know how to do normality because of that, right? The, new, the, the outline for the, general, general, the generalization of the Fullman result is, well, the moments match. In our context, we don't really know how to control higher moments, so we don't actually know how to, to generalize the normality, only the mean and the variance properties. Um, so I think maybe I'll elaborate a little further. Um, this expectation result, uh, an alternate interpretation, or maybe a, an easy corollary of it, is that uh, I think it's, it's supposed to be... Um, so an easy corollary of this expectation result is to prove like a, a sort of known folklore result about permutons, if that's an object you've encountered before, that permutons don't know cycle type. Um, basically, uh, so a permuton is sort of a limiting object of a, a, permu a, dis a sequence of permutations. Um, and uh, I guess it's not so important, the precise definition, except to say that um, it just depends on how many time you, you can determine them based on occurrences of patterns. And so that's exactly the type of statistics that we're talking about in our, in our setup. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I guess maybe I should break here and ask if there are any questions.
<laughs> no questions. All right. It's fair. Yep. So um the speaker first before we ask questions, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank um, you. So, yep. Any questions that you want to ask, Zach? Hmm. Can I ask one? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So ahead. this is probably some uh, long thing. So, so I see that in particular, this uh, part of permutation can include any. Uh, the number of times any given pattern ex, um, appears, right? Yeah. So um, by definition, the degree will be will be equal to the, the length of this pattern. So, exactly. so, uh, so does your result specialize to some classically long result for patterns showing up or, or is it new in this case? Oh yeah, yeah, maybe I should um, summarize some of that prior work. Um, so, Uh, pattern counts. Um, so let's see. So if you take a permutation pi um, and then P pi of sigma, so this is in SK, this is in SN, is the number of K tuples that restrict to the relative order pi. Is this the, the sort of function that you're asking about, uh, you think? Yeah. Okay. And so this is degree K. Um, so all of our moment results uh, were um, in work of Gates and Reba. Um, and that came out, I want to say, in maybe 2020. Um, so a little before our work. Um, they didn't, and then the normality is due to uh, Bona. And I think that's in maybe 04. And so oh. you can combine the moment result with the normality to sort of get any of the things we say. Part of our work is this extraction of the variance, um, which I mean, in principle could have been done, it's sort of analysis more so than than anything else. And, and neither of these authors did that sort of thing. Um, and then uh, there's also this sort of notion of uh, vincular patterns. And that's where we have these constraint, right? Uh, so you could do the same sort of thing, only now you're saying that certain parts of your pattern have to be like next to each other, or certain values in your pattern have to be adjacent. Um, so the vincular story um, is due to uh, Hofer in, I want to say, 2017. And uh, the vincular story for the moments was done um, by, I think the earliest reference I'm aware of is um, also like around 2019 or 2020. Um, and it's Dimitrov and Kare. And they do something more general for the moments, but it's only for the uniform distribution, nothing about cycle types. So, um, yeah. And then there's a recent paper where the locality type results are proved in a purely combinatorial fashion that came out the start of this year. And that's by Sheila and co-authors whose names I don't know all of. There, there are five total. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's there's a fair bit of prior work. Um, I'm not really aware of much prior work that can't sort of be slotted into our framework, though. Yeah, Sheila. 
Uh, yeah, so there are actually two uh, papers of Christian Gates. There's this one and then- Oh yeah, there's the Gates Pearson. Um, and that yeah. one is from 22. And that one, they do multiple patterns. So multiple classical patterns. So you can get all that from what you've done, right? Is that that's yeah. what you're saying? Uh, yeah, it you can. It, it's it's all they're all. I mean, sums of regular statistics are regular because they're defined in. Right. So, um, yeah. It's really it's, very very nice. Thank you. Um, yeah. It, and yeah, I mean, I, I know Brendan, when I've seen Brendan speak about it, you know, he spends almost the entire, well, not the entire, but maybe uh, half the talk on on this one slide. So there, there's a lot to it that I, I wish I could have gotten to, but um, yeah. Yeah, that's about right. It was uh, <laughs> nice to hear uh, your take on it, Zach. So <laughs> yeah, um, I think from my point of view, the miracle was that, um, this was a character evaluation problem, namely looking at uh, irreducible characters on sums of permutations that take a fixed set of positions to a fixed set of values. And this evaluation problem had a nice solution. So, uh, but yeah. this probabilistic stuff really is beautiful. Any other questions? If not that last fantasy speaker again. Thank you. Very nice job. Oh, let me write that, Ethan. Great talk. Yep.